the idyllic villages that cling to our coastline. This is absolutely breathtaking. Known for their beauty. To approach under sail like this is just thrilling. And serenity. It's a snapshot of a period that we've now lost. Now destinations for our leisure. But once they played a vital role in the history of our island nation. I can't believe this is actually happening. Oh, wow. We've got a lunar landscape there. It's incredibly important in terms of our heritage, and it's all happening here. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm intrigued by our coastal villages, because usually there's a much bigger story behind that picture-perfect postcard image. I've come to Alnmouth on England's northeast coast. It's 35 miles from the nearest city, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and sits on a low, flat ridge at the mouth of the River Alm, surrounded by sand-covered beaches. A small village now, but we'll discover its key role in feeding the nation 200 years ago. One of the commentators at the time actually said, these are the largest granaries in the country. How nature dramatically changed the fortunes of the village. What we see now is the aftermath. This hill that I'm on essentially was part of the village. And the help that came in the most unusual of ways. This is bird poo, yes, isn't it, yes. basically? I mean, these birds poo out copious quantities. It was a massive trade. There's a fascinating story to this village by the sea. To discover the trading secrets of Alnmouth, I need to view its coastline, but I'm not taking the most direct route. John, we've actually sailed right past Alnmouth and come in from down the coast. Why have we done that? Unfortunately, the entrance into Alnmouth is not that easy. We've got a sandbar extending quite a way north, so you have to actually turn in and then head along the edge of the beach, effectively you are totally sideways onto it and at the mercy of the, of the waves. As we come into the harbour here, I can start to feel some of its natural advantages. We're surrounded by high land, so the wind speed's cut right down. It's got a lot calmer. The waves have flattened out. It's a lovely, safe haven. I'm starting to see if I can spot any traces of this trading past. There's a wall there, but that looks like a retaining wall just to stop erosion rather than a harbour wall. I don't think ships would have moored against that. There's no dock, there's no pier. There's little trace that this was a busy, bustling trading port with ships going off up to Scotland, across to Norway, Holland, France, down the east coast to Newcastle and London. But it's amazing to think that Alma was one of the places that was key to feeding the nation. So what happened in the 18th century to transform a quiet village into a busy port town? I'm on Northumberland Street, and this is the main thoroughfare of Alnmouth. I'm trying to get a feel for the shape of the place. I've just walked down this slope here, and I'm heading towards the sea. But as I look down little alleyways and lanes, I can see that they're also sloping down to the shoreline. So I get a sense that I'm on the sort of ridge of a spur of land projecting out into the sea. But to find out what's going on, I think I need a, a view from above. Around 11 and a half thousand years ago, ice sheets that covered the area started to melt, 
creating great rivers that gouged through the landscape and left troughs and high points. And that's what the village was built on. But to see that even clearer, I've got some LiDAR pictures. Now, LiDAR is like a, a radar with light, and it just gives you height measurements above ground, but it does it very, very precisely. So the highest bits are red, it goes to an orangey and a yellow as you get lower, and the blue is the lowest still. That's effectively the sea here. And just look at this. There's a great crescent of high land projecting out towards the coast. And right at its very end, there's the village of Almas. Now, that's a perfect situation for a trading village because it's high enough not to get flooded, and yet it's right on the shoreline. In the mid-12th century, the barons of nearby Annick obtained a charter from King John to build a new village. It had a license for a market and a small port was formed. It's clear from early maps that Almuth's layout hasn't changed much at all. However, thanks to political instability, plague and invasions, it wasn't until the 17th century that Almuth finally began to prosper. difficult to imagine today's relaxed village as a bustling trading port, but at its height in around 1750, there would have been up to 18 large trading vessels out there in the harbour, and they would have been offloading and loading cargo such as beer, pork, eggs, wool, coal, timber, all this stuff going backwards and forwards. And the streets were so busy that there was actually a law preventing carts standing for too long, a sort of forerunner of today's parking restrictions. And that frenetic activity is mirroring what's happening in the country. The Industrial Revolution led to England's population rising from less than 6 million in 1750 to almost 17 million by 1851, and they needed feeding. There was a huge demand for grain. Places like Almuth become increasingly important, not just to the health of the region, but the health of the nation. In the 1700s, the fertile plain of Northumberland was an extensive grain growing area, producing more than the county needed. To transport surplus grain, a long toll road was built, stretching from inland Hexham almost 50 miles to Almouth. This became known as the Corn Road. Almouth's merchants were ideally placed to make money shipping this golden asset to the UK's urban areas and beyond to the continent. Local historian Adrian Osler has researched Almouth's grain export and is showing me one of the village's earliest granaries. Here's an interesting building. Yes, seen some quite changes. Quite a big one too. My goodness, it is right from the street front there, going back. What's that? 100 metres, 100. just over. Yeah, I can already see there's a succession of buildings here, more or less the same idea being repeated over and over again to create this one long range. And this is the earliest one, fronting onto the main street as it was then, a granary for a local farmer. It looks agricultural. I know it's got little cottagey windows in it now, but you can see this is the ultimate historic barn conversion. So the grain is stored on the first floor, second floor. How many floors? Had we got been here originally? four in all at the front, yeah. but curiously, two at the back, because you're running up the slope over the gravel yeah, ridge that the whole settlement is based on. Well, look at like skyscrapers. It's like New York, you know, you can't build out. You've got to build up yeah. because the whole settlement is just too small. This is actually storing a lot of grain, and it wasn't the only granary. No, there's another dozen at least like this when they're most active. Everybody wanted to be in on the business when it was booming. One of the commentators at the time actually said, these are the largest granaries in the country, perhaps a little bit over the top. What impact did this industry have on the village as a whole? You needed carters to cart the grain. You needed blacksmiths to repair their vehicles. 
you needed pubs to replenish the thirsty workers. Yeah. That's just a few. And you needed the ships themselves, and they brought investment back in. So we're talking about a variety of, of grain here, aren't we? So we're co corn for flour, oats, barley. Not a great deal of barley then, some for malting, but principally oats, and oats for, for animal food, and to a certain extent, people food as well, but principally animal food. The world. whole country was horse-powered. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it was, it was, we're talking well pre-steam, everything was horse, and horses had to be fed, and it was the oats that oats fed that did it. So it was, <laughs> it was places like this that were, that were powering those, those engines, really. Yeah. The old granaries in the village have all been repurposed. Hindmarsh Hall was originally converted into a church and is now a community centre. This former granary has become a bed and breakfast, and the one that Adrian showed me is now a post office and four homes. And if I'm lucky, we'll see some more features that tell the history of these buildings. You can see they're separate cottages. Now, ah, this is important. Look, a stair going up to what was a first floor entrance. And look at those steps. Look how worn they are. You get a real sense of people trudging up and down there for decades and decades with these heavy, heavy sacks of grain. Over 300 years later, Hilary Burns lives here and she's allowing me to take a peek inside. Wow. Got some old timbers up here. We have. Oh, wow, look at this. Fantastic. You can see there are still barnacles on some of the really? bits of sandstone. Oh, yeah. So basically, they've just been down to the foreshore. They've picked up a piece of stone that's just lying around. Right, I'm building a granary. I'll put that in there as well. That's right. Oh, more old joists. They're pretty agricultural, and the only thing they've done is they've taken off the sharp edge here. So if you bump your head, you don't split your head open on a sharp angle. But there's no display or prestige here. It's all functional, isn't it? But there is now. But there is now, <laughs> of course, yes, yes. When you were doing the place up, did you find anything else that gave you a clue about the past of this building? We certainly did. When we took the, the plaster off the walls, the plasterboard, and you can see how far the plasterboard came to about here. There's a big gap behind it. Right. And a load of grain from, it must have been hundreds of year old grain came out. Any building that's been used as a barn or a granary, genuinely, you will find it all over the place. We still do, actually. It's amazing. The quantity and size of these granaries shows just how successful Almuth had become. And there's evidence of this prosperity on other roads in the village. This used to be called Gallon Terrace, after the Gallon family that had property here. Edward Gallon inherited this from his uncle John. They were corn factors, they were merchants. Edward had two large warehouses in the village, was a justice of the peace, and in the middle of the 18th century, they were big players, and Almuth was booming. And wealthy merchants like the Gallons wanted impressive homes. Well, the thing that strikes me right from the off, and the thing that's most obvious, is it's brick. They've got stone, they've been perfectly happily using it for hundreds of years. This is a new idea. And this is someone who's doing really quite well. The current owner of this unusual building is Alastair Ridley. Hello there, Alastair. Hello there. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. You've got a fantastic building here. Yeah. Really distinctive. We get cars stopping all the time and taking photographs, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know about the history of the house? Well, I think the brick came in as ballast and then they took grain away to Holland or wherever the bricks came from. I'm a bit sort of puzzled by this, though, because usually ballast, you're using the odds and ends and bits and pieces, bits of rock you pick up from here and there. And to have enough brick for a whole building project, you know, a massive house like this, that's quite something. That's a, that's a quite specialised cargo, so I don't know. 
this is polite Georgian architecture. This is someone of means, basically. And they're right on the main street here yeah. as well. It's not quite Millionaire's Row, <laughs> but this is where the people who had money were. Almouth's booming grain industry gave rise to many wealthy residential properties in the village. But it wasn't all work in Georgian times. Income from the port was also being spent at the pub. I'm doing a walking tour of Almouth's pubs, which is a nice thing to be doing. And there are four today, which is quite a lot for a small place these days. But back in the 18th century, there were at least ten. And this one's called the Sun Inn. Now, an inn was different to a normal pub in that it offered lodgings. People were pouring into this place. They needed refreshment, they needed beer, they needed lodgings. Just taking a little breather here, but it's all in the name of research. Because I've got an extract here from the trade directory of the 1790s and it gives a great idea of who's here and who's doing what at the time. And we've got Thomas Adams, corn factor. We've got another Thomas here, corn factor, publican, corn factor, publican. Basically, if you're not dealing in corn, you're dealing in beer, you're a publican. And sometimes you're both. Here we go. John Jobson, corn factor and publican. Must have been a very busy man. Clearly, in the 18th century, Almouth was flourishing. But with not much evidence of a port today, something happened to change the fate of this village. On Christmas Day, 1806, a great tidal surge swept through the village, cutting off the land on which the church was sitting. The river changed course. The shape of the harbour was altered forever. Oh, I've got a great view of the seashore here, and I can see the river coming winding in here and winding out. What we see now is the aftermath of the storm of 1806. So this course now, the river as it winds through here and comes between us and the village, that's not its original course. That's where it broke through in 1806. Before then, this hill that I'm on, and it's quite a substantial hill, would have been linked to the village. There would have been a ridge of high land running through here. So this essentially was part of the village. I think we can get a better view of where the river used to run. Up here, yes, we can. You see that area of short grass there behind the dunes? I'm pretty sure that's the old course of the River Owl. So imagine it coming in here, sweeping around this headland, round the back here, right round through the marsh, and then off into that direction. It's quite incredible. That's a really radical shift in the course of the river. The Great Storm of 1806 marks the start of the decline of Almouth as a port, but it did leave one positive legacy for the village, salt marshes. Coastal geomorphologist Helen Brooks studies changing landscapes like this one. Well, it's absolutely beautiful here, Helen, and I love the colours of these salt marshes. But it's not about that, is it? it these are significant for other reasons. Exactly, yes. It's very good at protecting local areas, so any houses or agricultural land that are nearby from storm surges and that kind of high water levels as they come in off the sea. We've got all this vegetation here and it provides kind of a friction against the water which slows it down and the height of the waves and the water reduce. And as we've got a bit higher up, suddenly it's carpeted with vegetation. Yep. So, for example, over here we see um, samphire, which you might know from dinner time sometimes. And these are just very early growing ones. And these are much more rubbery and like a cactus, they have kind of a hollow center where they store water. So that's the key to it. Whereas other bits of the coast are getting eroded, a salt marsh by inclination is building up the whole time. 
And this is sort of hidden away, but it's so important. Exactly. What we refer to these as often is nature-based solutions, and these provide many of the same benefits um, as fixed hard engineering structures such as seawalls. Definitely providing a lot more than a seawall. You've got to love our salt marshes. <laughs> Following this major landscape change, the village is determined to persevere and keep on with its trading function. But it's not just nature that it has to contend with after the great storm. It's the fact that ships are getting bigger. There isn't enough water in the harbour for the largest boats, so they have to wait out there in the sea and smaller boats have to go out fetching and cargoes backwards and forwards. It was all very inconvenient. So in the early 19th century, Alnmouth needed to look for different opportunities to keep the port operating. And in the mid-1800s, they found a new trade, bringing a very special fertiliser from Peru called guano. Dr Leslie Kinsley is an environmental historian. Hi there, Leslie. We've chosen to meet somewhere very specific yeah. this old barn but it's a special barn well it's it? amazing i'm very excited that this looks as if it's potentially used for guano use when we're yes. talking guano yes. we're talking a not very nice yes. substance this is bird poo yes, isn't it yes. basically yes it is and farmers loved it because it was easy to transport about it was like a powder and it was intense and the mariners used to say that they could smell it from miles away when they went to actually pick the guano up from the chincha islands off the coast of peru it absolutely stank but why is guano so important? The population was growing, the population needed feeding. British fields were nutrient poor. We needed more nutrients. It's just extraordinary that we're going half the way around the world to collect this disgusting substance and to bring it back to places like this in Almuth. Why was it worth all that effort? In Peru, when the first Spanish actually saw the reserves there, they were 50 feet thick. I mean, these birds, the guane, poo out copious quantities of this poo. They even nest in it. It was such a big thing. It was so important. It was part of an, another agricultural revolution mm -hmm. and yet almost forgotten today. It was a massive trade, absolutely massive. Well, certainly local legend has it that this was where the guano was ah, stored. right. And it makes sense to me because we're quite some way from the yes. village. And actually, I noticed the river. It would have been ideal yeah. to drop it off. The river plays a key part yeah. in, in Olmuth's history. Yeah. Like you say, this is a bulk good. It's a yeah. horrible substance. Yeah. You yeah. don't want to be moving it around too no, much no, and no. carting it down roads no. and on the railways. Yeah, move it by boat. It makes sense. Yeah. Something I've noticed in this ruin, there's a lot more nettles around than there is outside. Mm. And to me, nettles are a sign of nutrient-rich soils, mm. phosphates, mm. nitrates. Mm. And I just wonder whether this is starting to give an indication that this building had manure in it, had guano in it, had cow poo, sheep poo, maybe all sorts of things. But of course, if there were nitrates in the soil then with no roof on, nitrates are soluble, so you probably wouldn't find nitrates in the soil now. But you might find a higher phosphate content in the soil because Phosphates generally are insoluble. Well, we have got a little test oh, kit. Oh, wow. <laughs> we, can, we can see if this okay. is a phosphate-rich environment. Let's go and have a look. <laughs> there are no known remaining guano sheds in the UK, so to find potential evidence of one would be a real reward. But we must dig deep to avoid finding traces of phosphates from more recent fertiliser. Let's have a look here. All this soil on top here is going to be yeah. mostly build up since the barn was disused. Oh, I bet something hard. Oh, it looks a little bit concretey. Oh. <laughs> so it's not stone. You start to use concretes yeah. late, late in the 19th century, 20th century. So that one, in fact, would cover up the evidence. It if it's would. Old, if it's uh, too new. Exactly. So we're going to have to find somewhere else. 
right. We'll come near the door here where we've lost the concretey stuff. And if this is where they brought the guano in, there could well have been spillage around here, couldn't there? So? Well, it's a big doorway yeah, and it we're is. very close to the entrance here. We're literally right on the threshold, so. And look at that, the saw texture is very different. I'll just go a little bit deeper. Now that's a bit deeper. There's nothing modern in there. We'll try some of this from here. Yes, shall we? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. To test for phosphates in this deeper soil, I need to pour water, add a little reagent, allow it to settle, and then look for a colour change. If the water turns blue, it's proof of phosphates, an evidence that this may have been a guano shed. The suspension is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a science joke. That was very good. <laughs> So here we go. We've left it a little while now, giving it a chance. What do you reckon? Well, I, I detect a slight shade of blue. It might be wishful thinking, but... <laughs> There's the merest, the merest hint of blue there. It's hardly even a one, but there is a bluey tinge. Yeah, there is a colour change. That, which indicates some level of phosphate. Although our tests on the phosphate are somewhat inconclusive, there is a newspaper article here that sheds more light on the storage of guano in this area. And it says here, on the south side of the river and south of Church Hill at Alnmouth, there stands a large old granary. At present, the upper floors are converted into numerous tenements. But here's the thing, one of the floors is used for the deposit of guano and bone manures. <laughs> and then inevitably, a complaint has reached me, and surely not unreasonably, of the terrible odours of these manures from which the tenants suffer. It's disgusting, they're living above the guano. I think that's a step too far. Despite the town turning its hand to other trades and trying to manage the effects of the storm, the arrival of better roads and the railway effectively signalled the end of Almuth as a sea trading port. In 1896, a timber merchant ship called the Joanna overturned in the harbour, and that was it. That was effectively the end. No one could bring large ships into the port again. Alnmouth had a central role to play in feeding the nation, shipping out vast quantities of corn and then bringing in an early fertiliser to make the crops grow better. And in a way, it's still sustaining the nation because people come from far and wide to be fed and watered here and just enjoy this beautiful and extraordinary village by the sea.